So, hello everyone. Here we are with Neil Repkowski, my famous friend, whom I've known for more than 20 years, I think. Could be, yeah, yeah probably. It it's yeah. more than 20 years. And um, we have Barbara Mangi, my colleague and wife, and hello. esteemed collaborator, and Dr. Josie Conti. Who's a faculty at Central Maine Medical Center of Family Medicine Residency? Mm -hmm. So, um, how exciting! We're sitting out in Cas Cas Casadega. Casadega, New York, on Neil's porch, with uh, with appropriate social distancing. All of us are at least two meters apart. Yeah. So we're not wearing masks, but that's the reason, because we're socially distanced. <clears throat> And uh, we're here to have a conversation with Neil. And uh, so I wanted to start by just inviting Neil to talk about his experiences um, when AIDS began to appear. And then we'll, we'll see what parallels we can draw to uh, between COVID-19 and, and uh, HIV. And we'll just keep the conversation going. Well, back in 1981, just to give you a short recap of the history of AIDS, back in 1981, uh, some uh, gay men were getting uh, Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocystis pneumonia, which was predictive of a compromised immune system. We really didn't see those things very much unless the doctors were compromising the immune system, like for instance, uh, to decrease it uh, for avoiding a kidney plant uh, rejection, et cetera. So very interestingly, these people were, young gay people were showing up with, uh, with conditions predictive of a, of a poisoned immune system, basically, except that they weren't being poisoned with the... Uh... Sorry, Lewis. Okay, okay. So... Okay, <laughs> okay. Sorry. where were we? Sorry, okay, yeah. good, we were no, talking that's good. About 1981. Yeah, 1981. So for, first of all, some, some gay people showed up with uh, uh, diseases predictive of, um, of a compromised immune system. And uh, the doctors were fascinated because they weren't compromising the system. It was being done all by themselves. So somehow uh, these conditions, of course, back then there was uh, T-cell testing was basically a very experimental thing, wasn't widely available. So they, they named it gay-related immunodeficiency grid. Gay-related immunodeficiency. Well, then some straight people from New York who happened to be IV drug users got the thing, and they weren't gay. So they had to change the name from gay-related immunodeficiency to somehow these people were acquiring immunodeficiency all by themselves without the help of chemotherapy or immune suppressants from doctors. So they changed the name to AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency, whether you were gay or not. At that time, there were four main uh, groups that were prone to pick up this unusual condition. And what you had to have was a, uh, was, a, was a condition predictive of an underlying immune deficiency in your body. This was uh, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, uh, disseminated crypto, cryptococcus, different, different things, crypt, uh, disseminated candida, uh, other conditions predictive of a, a lousy immune system. And it was called the 4-H club. You were either homosexual, heroin user, uh, uh, hemophiliac, or Haitian, interestingly enough. And uh, people were puzzled about the Haitian thing, but uh, eventually uh, they figured out that the people from Haiti were actually uh, used as French speakers to go to the Belgian Congo at the time and teach the, the, the natives. Uh, and of course, uh, at that time, Leopold, Leopoldville, which is named after King Leopold in Belgium, um, which is now called Kinshasa, the, the capital of the Congo. But back then, Leopoldville was the center of the Congo where the Haitians were teaching and the people from the bush would come in to the red light district and join the teachers from Haiti who were teaching and they picked up uh, HIV strains from there and went over to Haiti and uh, then uh, gave uh, blood, which was sent to the United States. And so the Haitians basically, that's how they were implicated. Uh, they actually ended up uh, coming back from Africa, carrying the HIV with them. So it was a perfect storm. And then of course the transfusion in the United States started spread there largely in the gay community at the time. 
anyway, that's a little bit of a quick background on, on the 4-H club. Uh, back then, uh, a lot of gay people were, were dying. Of course, there was no uh, cure or, or even uh, treatment for it. And um, rumors started to fly that this was a Russian plot that was uh, planted in the United States to kill off the gay people. And then it was a plot by the United States to kill off the IV drug users. I mean, there was all kinds of different propaganda, conspiracy theories, which of course blossomed parallelly or in parallel with the COVID thing. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories. In, uh, theories. Instead, of, instead of Russia, now it's China. China did this to wipe us out and you know, but it's the same dynamic you know people want to explain things and they come up with these crazy conspiracy things which stoke fear people love fear that's why they know horror movies and i think the conspiracy theories are the same thing so back when aids was around you know it was russian plot or the united states uh, uh engineered the virus uh, to get rid of the homosexual and IV drug population and then it was uh it was vaccine experimentation uh, that created it, and uh, it was uh, hepatitis B vaccine was contaminated with the HIV. All kinds of, of theories, which of course, none of which were true. I remember early on, uh, before we really had uh, good medicine for HIV, we had AZT out and things in the late 80s, but around the late 80s or early 90s, there was a conference, I think it was in Geneva, Switzerland, the AIDS, AIDS, World AIDS Conference, and there was a demonstration. And the demonstrators outside the conference were, were saying that aspirin was the cure for AIDS, but it was being withheld because the pharmacy companies were, wanted to make a lot of money with the new AZT and things that were out. And in, in, there's a partial truth to that because aspirin inhibits NF-kappa B, which is a kind of a, a growth regulator for HIV. So there is a partial truth to it, but it certainly wasn't a cure. But they took this little kernel of truth and they turned it into a big plot. Same thing with COVID. The kernel of truth is with COVID, you get some uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which, uh, which you can help avoid with a little bit of aspirin. So they took that truth and the same thing, you know, they're, they're uh, taking there's a plot that the pharmaceuticals want to make a lot of money, the pharmacy companies, and so uh, they're suppressing the use of aspirin. Well, in fact, there's a kernel of truth to that, but it's not true. So it just stokes the theories. So there's a lot of parallels in, uh, in what happened with HIV and what's happening with COVID. And we're looking now with HIV, we have good treatments and even uh, treatments that can be used to prevent picking it up. I think eventually, e even be, certainly we don't have a vaccine for uh, HIV, which has been researched for 20 some years, well, almost 30 years. So I don't know if we never have a vaccine for COVID uh, because it changes so much. I mean, it may be partially successful, but I think we're gonna get some medicines. We're gonna know how to treat better. We already do. We know that a little bit of steroid helps and uh, we know that resolutostatin res helps. So, uh, is that important? Uh, time to uh, edit, right? <laughs> yeah. I was saying they were working on a vaccine for HIV, which they still don't have after 25 plus years. So we may or may not get a vaccine for COVID, for, for the coronavirus a strain. And the strain does mutate just like HIV mutates. There's different, what are called clades or different groups of mutations. Um, so will we have a vaccine that's 100% effective? Never, uh, but maybe it'll help. Um, but just like with HIV, we don't have a vaccine for HIV, but we have good treatments now with very few, if any, side effects for most people. So probably for COVID, we're already we're better able to treat it. We know that a little steroid helps and we know even uh, like we were saying, hydroxychloroquine might be useful to some degree. Uh, but I think as we refine our medications or so we stand, uh, there's di different things. Um, we, we will get a better handle on this and be able to treat people before they get really sick with it, which will be useful. Of course, Nothing is 100% effective, same with HIV. I mean, we've got it really under control, but uh, 
the thing is finding it, treating it um, before it gets the best of you. And I think it's the same with coronavirus, which uh, has a little bit uh, quicker incubation than, of course, HIV, which can sit there for 10 years uh, asymptomatically. Coronavirus, I think it's two to three weeks. So more studies will show. So where, where, what else were we talking about there? Chlor hydro oh, yeah, the, the studies with hydroxychloroquine and uh, some of the studies show it helps, some don't help. It depends on how you set the study up. You can almost set up a study to show anything you want if you're uh, a little biased. Indeed. Against it. Uh, people are anti-vaccine and one guy uh, years ago published that uh, measles vaccine was associated with autism and it got into the Lancet. And when people looked at his data, he had an agenda and fudged the factors to prove his point. Uh, when in fact, there's no association with measles vaccine and autism, but that because it made the journals back then, people still remember it. And I always say first impressions are lasting impressions. And once you get it in your head, it's hard to get it out of the head, even if you have evidence that contradicts your first impression. I think that's a little bit what we're seeing with, uh, oh, we were talking about the political spins, for instance, on hydroxychloroquine. There are, Trump said it, it would help. Then studies showed it didn't help. So people re, republished those studies and really made a big deal out of it, mainly because they wanted to get at Trump, when in fact other studies show it does help to some degree. So, you know, there's a lot of political spin on this, just like with HIV, it was fun to fit people's political agenda. And you were talking too about, you know, other aspirin and intravenous uh, vitamin C and yeah, so there was a there was a demonstration uh, back, uh, I think it was in the early 90s, there was an uh, international AIDS conference in Geneva, and the demonstrators outside were claiming that aspirin was uh, the cure for AIDS, and it was being suppressed by the pharmaceutical companies who wanted to make money on fancy drugs, and there was a kernel of truth to that, because aspirin does uh, have a mechanism interaction with NF-kappa B, which is a regulator of HIV growth in the cells. So, but it's not a cure. And so similar to COVID, aspirin is an antithrombotic. In other words, it helps prevent little clots in your system. And um, part of COVID's problem is that it causes these little clots in the system, creating little micro strokes, uh, little heart uh, attacks, uh, little uh, poor circulation in the feet, which causes a rash in your feet. So aspirin will help that to an extent, but it's certainly not a cure. So of course, you can expect demonstrations saying that pharmaceutical companies are suppressing the cure for uh, COVID, which is aspirin. And actually, you know, there's COVID-19 is the end result of the virus, which is called SARS-CoV-2, which is SARS coronavirus 2, just like HIV causes AIDS, SARS coronavirus 2 causes COVID-19. So there is a there is a confusion in that, and there there will be just like with AIDS. There's a confusion. Well, you have AIDS. No, I'm just HIV positive. Well, then you have AIDS. It's like you have uh, coronavirus uh, COVID. You know, you have coronavirus uh, SARS coronavirus two. No, you have COVID nineteen. There's it's it's you know it's it's confusing to the public. It's even confusing to the medical medical people. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that the Chinese reported benefit from IV vitamin C for hospitalized patients and neo vitamin C for prevention. And we haven't picked up on that at all in this country. Yeah, well, you know, that Linus Pauling thing, vitamin C, it does help viruses to a point. And it's parallel, reminds me of vitamin C being touted IV for HIV as well. And I did have a patient who was all over the place and uh, he was into natural remedies and all kinds of stuff. He was taking coenzyme Q and everything. So he wanted me to give him IV vitamin C, which I did. I gave him IV vitamin C and IV multiple vitamins, everything like that. Even injected pure I, uh, vitamin C solution into his capacies lesions. I did that uh, sub Q, you know, it didn't do anything except very interestingly. And I, I asked the lab about this because I would do labs after I gave him all that IV vitamin C and his cholesterol went down to like six 
which is like, <laughs> what? It's got to be, an, an, you know, in, interfering somehow with his cholesterol measurement. But they, they claim that, that the vitamin C didn't affect the cholesterol assay. So I thought, well, then that, that proves that there's something with uh, vitamin C and, uh, you know, lifting uh, cholesterol plaques from the body because it basically got rid of all the cholesterol. It was amazing. So that's the only interesting thing I found. But, but of course, he's, he's passed on now. It, it, vitamin C didn't do anything for his, uh, his AIDS or his capsaicin sarcoma, even with interlesional injections which back then were thought to be useful. So, you know, I have a, an experiment of one. <laughs> yeah. uh, it reminds me, you know, I, me, back, uh, in back in the 80s, I was 80s part, of part of a trial of typhoid, trial of typhoid vaccine. Typhoid vaccine. Oh, yes. the, 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 it was, the theory was the theory developed by, developed by Heimlich, you know, Heimlich, you know, who invented the Heimlich, Heimlich maneuver, Heimlich of course. Maneuver, of course. Uh-huh. And... Um, and um, he, his idea was, his that, idea if was that if you stimulate the immune system, system, you can boost it. Can boost it. And so we were so giving, we're giving injections, injections of typhoid, typhoid vaccines, vaccines to, induce to induce a fever. fever. That was our yeah, goal, was, our was goal to was induce a fever. 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 And of course, and we of figured course, out that it actually didn't, actually didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. Yeah, I had a, I have a colleague who was an HIV doctor at the time who was injecting himself with tetanus boosters mm. all the time for his immune system. He's still around, by the way. So. Well, well, you know, the interesting well, you know, the thing I was telling you earlier was, earlier was that we did get a response, get a response to the typhoid vaccine. And, yeah. and, and, and out of, I think it was 140 patients, 17 continued to manifest the response. And, and uh, over years. So we figured out that, that there is such a thing as a placebo effect or a self healing response with HIV. And again, we were talking about this earlier, there's an individual condition where an individual will benefit from the treatment and not really, I don't think, placebo, and, and another individual will not benefit from the same treatment. For example, I was meditating and, and what's called a mastermind group, you, you call into your mind uh, people who, who know what they're doing. And so I had this mastermind group and I asked them, for me back in 1980, no, 19... Yeah, 1990 actually it was early 90 when when a, when AZT was first coming out as treatments, and I had HIV. I probably picked up uh, HIV. It had to be in 1982 or earlier, and the reason is in 1983 we knew whatever was causing this condition was a virus and was spread by blood and body fluids. And well, we didn't know it was a virus. We knew whatever it was was spread by blood, blood and body fluids. So in 1983. That's when healthcare workers and dentists uh, and IV technicians universally started using gloves and universal precautions. And so I used gloves on all actual fluids, so we started using condoms. So in 1983 was the time I started using gloves and condoms. Before that, I wasn't using condoms or gloves. So, and most likely I picked it up from sexual encounter without condoms, but I had to have been infected in 1982. The test was not invented, the the antibody test, until July of 1985 for the public. So in July of 1985, I took it uh, and was HIV positive, you know, with the antibodies uh, back in July of 85. Never forget the day I opened the result. Um, But I figured I picked picked it up, it had to be 82 or before. So I you know I'm HIV positive now, what, 37 years, over half my life, I'm 68. So, uh, but anyway, so I was asking in 1990 in this meditation group, I asked my mastermind group, I said, what can I do to help myself survive with HIV? Because there were, the medicines had bad side effects and everything. And I, what they showed me was a field of grain And I know what grain looks like, and I knew it wasn't oats, because that's a different kind of looking grain. I knew it wasn't rice. It looked like either wheat, rye, triticale, or barley, all which have these bearded little seeds. So, rice, triticale, barley, wheat, you know. And as soon as I asked that in my mind, I saw underneath seven round loaves of bread, and it told me, it reminded me there's a parable in the Bible about seven barley loaves uh, that were multiplied for a crowd by Jesus. So I thought, okay, this is barley. So I thought, well, spirit must want me to take barley. So I bought barley cereal. 
Ultra's music. I don't think I made barley broth soup, which I didn't think from spirit. That sh that's pointing you in the direction of something that's helpful. You'll get a confirmation. So within less than two weeks, out of the blue, this woman calls me. Her name was Kathy O'Jude. I still remember her name. I never met the woman, never talked to her but once. But she said, I heard you have HIV and I have something I want to tell you about. Network marketing. And I'm going, oh no, not network marketing. What are you trying to sell me? She said, it's called Barley Green. And I thought, Barley Green, tell me more about that. So I bought Barley Green and it's basically young barley plants that are juiced and dehydrated into a powder, tastes like lawnmower juice. So, so I started taking Barley Green. I didn't do network marketing with that, I just took it. And my T cells, which were able to be measured back then by 91, we had T cell testing went up and uh, viral load testing yet, but my T cells went up. So I continued to take barley green once or twice a day. And uh, as the later I had a viral load that was smoldering, but I think I, I have to credit the barley green with helping my immune system. After a couple of years on it, I decided one summer that, well, you know, we're, we're doing, I'm, I was on medical trials and things with different medicines. So I stopped the barley green, T cells went down. So I, I went back on it. And I, I said, well, you know, maybe this will help some of my patients. So I gave my patients barley green. Two, I think two out of 10 that I gave it to, it helped a little bit, but it didn't help like it helped me. So we'll go to individual therapy that works. Uh, since then, of course, we have really good medicines for HIV, so I stopped the barley green regularly, although I still take it about once a week. So, you know, individual therapy. And another anecdote, you know, I was telling Lewis earlier, I was working at the Fenway Community Health Center in Boston uh, back in, this was 1990, 91. <clears throat> I had a patient who was a, a hefty, young, good-looking gay man who lived in San Diego, but he developed what's called cryptosporidial diarrhea, of which there was no cure back then. And he ended up from being, I think he was 190 pounds, went down to 130 and went back to his family in Boston basically to die. Me at the General Hospital and finding that he had crypto cryptosporidial diarrhea. He was on tincture of opium and paragoric and all these uh, opioids to help constipate him. He was still having 12 watery bowel movements a day, losing weight. So I did my best to help care for him. But two weeks before Christmas, he came in with a hemoglobin of like 6.5. And I said, you know, you need, I mean, his blood was practically water. I said, you need a transfusion. We'll put you in Beth Israel, give you a transfusion. And, you know, you're not getting any food. You're not going to build up your hemoglobin unless we IV feed you. And he said, and he came in with his father because he was too weak to come in by himself. His father brought him in in a wheelchair. And he said, I'll do anything you ask if I can just spend the weekend with my family. Because before I was in that I came home. So I looked at the father and I said, you want to do anything? And for some reason in my head popped your Casey's castor oil remedy, which is basically a topical application of castor oil on the stomach. So I said, you know, have him watch TV, sit, lean him on the floor, put a heating pad with castor oil over his right upper quadrant and do that over the weekend and bring him in on Monday and we'll get the transfusion set up. Well, I have so many patients, I, you know, I, I forgot that he missed his appointment on Monday. They, they actually called and changed it. And then they changed it again, unbeknownst to me, you know, I, I'd forgotten uh, about him. And uh, two weeks later, I walked right past him in the, in the waiting room because he had gained weight and was complaining for the first time of constipation after so many years of diarrhea. I couldn't believe it. He was basically cured of cryptosporidial diarrhea. So I had two other patients at that time with the same thing. I gave him the castor oil pack recommendation, didn't work. But for him, it worked because it popped into my head right at the opportune time. It was a, it was a miracle. So, um, so individual therapies beyond placebo, I think, uh, are something that probably now we were talking about gene therapy, gene identification. Maybe now we have DNA fingerprints. We can maybe individualize therapies that may work for one person, but not for everybody. And, and, and it's sort of, sort of mainstream medicine, medicine would, would trivialize, trivialize sort of spirit-guided spirit -guided therapies. therapies. And yet, that was definitely spirit -guided. Yeah. yeah. And we've both and seen we've that. Both we've seen both gotten really, really seemingly strange messages really strange that we've 
given to people and if and they've done them and it's worked i mean i remember once telling someone to eat watermelon for 30 days and and she said why and i said i don't know it just came to me yeah and she actually did it which may have been what cured her more than the watermelon was the fact that she did it yeah and 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 she was amazingly better amazingly better these days and, yeah. and and we've all we've seen, seen that. that. Yeah. And yet it's, it's minimized, minimized by, by you know mainstream, you know, mainstream medicine, which only accepts randomized controlled trials. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is applicable to a large group, but not to an individual. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Point. Yeah. yeah. Point. There, are, there are some women's breast cancer. Breast cancer. I mean, women's breast cancer. Breast cancer has been really helped by genetic testing and yeah. genetic testing of the tumors and knowing what. Um, knowing what kinds of what you're dealing with there so there is something so <laughs> there is something you know in that idea of individualized medicine but also the genetic component to be able to look at the signatures and another piece of information yeah, yeah. Interesting. But, yeah. i think the yeah one more oh, yeah, anecdote yeah. Oh, yeah. uh i had um this was when i came back from boston i was here right here in this county uh caring for hiv positive patients and I had a female cabinet maker who also had cryptosporidial diarrhea. It was very, um, very, I mean, I, I, obviously hindering her lifestyle. Tried the castor oil pack, didn't work. So all of a sudden in my head popped tincture of walnut, which is an antiparasitic. And I just happened to have gone to the serpent mound in Ohio, which is a sacred place. And all over the serpent mound grow these walnut black walnut trees and i collected black walnut hulls from the serpent mound and made a tincture of walnut i happened to have it so when i was treating her in my mind pop give her a tincture of walnut so i took some of the walnut preparation i had prepared from the serpent mound which is spiritually charged interestingly enough and i gave her like a, a cup of of a tincture of walnut and i said i don't know why but i said take a, a quarter of a teaspoon once a day of this and see what happens with your diarrhea fixed she she was able to have one bomb movement today after that so she uh, lived uh, for another year with cryptosporidial diarrhea being controlled with tincture of walnut she had uh, unfortunately she had aids wasting um and uh, knew her time was coming to an end although she was more comfortable with her bowel movements and it was sweet. She made. She was a cabinet maker, and she made me uh, a sun, moon, and stars before she passed. I still have it out to you, but uh, yeah. So, so, but, but for her, making her more comfortable, it popped in my head. And I've tried tincture of walnut for other people; it doesn't work. But for her, it worked. But the castor oil packs did not. So it's interesting how spirit individualizes therapy. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and it yeah. and it somehow the the, the, the traditional, traditional elders did that. Yeah, I, I remember going, I remember to, a going to a conference with a, a traditional elder. Who, you know, we were on a panel. You know, and and there was a nurse in the audience, and she asked him, "So how do you treat arthritis?" And he said, "Well, I don't know her." Why don't you, Why don't bring, you her bring her around to my, my house, house tomorrow, tomorrow and I'll let you know. know. There you go. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. exactly. And certain preparation, like I mentioned, this tincture of walnut was collected in a certain way in a certain place. So you can say, oh, well, we'll just take some walnut hulls and make tincture of walnut. It may not work. There's a walnut tree right there. And I've made tincture of walnut from that tree, which is growing on sacred land. So, and it's sitting in my refrigerator. So if anybody has diarrhea during the con during this uh, time, I'll give them some tincture of walnut and see what happens. <laughs> well, you know, there's, a, there's a, um, a wonderful, you know, Eduardo Duran, who um, is a he's, a, he's a psychologist, he's a, he's a Buffalo gentleman, and he was talking about uh, ingesting spirits, and in his case, he was talking about uh, the spirits, and in, in, he was talking about substance use, and he uh -huh. was talking about, you know, the way something is prepared, especially cocaine or heroin in war zones, in these secretive ways, yeah. and, you know, in, in, in back alleys. Do you want that spirit in your body do you want do, oh, you know, yeah. so part of that <clears throat> what you, you just remind me that knowing where it comes from knowing how it 
how it was grown was uh, was a real piece of the medicine. Yeah, there's a story about uh, a medicine man uh, who, uh, who, uh, who, anyway, somebody was bleeding, very bad nosebleed, um, and nothing was stopping it. So they took him to the medicine man, and the medicine man did a ceremony, and he said, you know, I don't know if I can help you, but there's a certain herb, you go out and look, and if it glows, it will work, that one, glowing. So it will appear differently. Then, so the, the person went out, uh, the wife of the person went out and saw the herb growing, and it was in various places, but it wasn't glowing. But one spot, it was glowing. And she took that, and it worked. So, you know, even the, I, and I was telling Lewis the other day, uh, I was in a sweat lodge ceremony, and we had a stone that had a, that gave off acrid odor and everybody was coughing and they said what kind of medicine can we use and of course i was berating myself because i didn't have the traditional prairie sage all i had was sage from my garden and for some reason i had it on the altar so i thought well you know it's better than nothing so i just gave garden sage which i don't put too much stock in but it was there and i pass it around people chewed a little bit of it there wasn't one single cough the entire rest of the lodge and it, it taught me that what you need is made available at that time in that place under those circumstances from the spirits to work. And you can say, well, it'll work other times. No, just like the cast oil packs or the tincture of walnut, it worked for those people at that time, but other people in other circumstances didn't work. So I think spirit, I think medicines are infused with spirit energy sometimes for a specific purpose. But if you take the same plant that's not infused or not growing in the you right know, way. No, just not related to viruses, you know, but related one of the reasons I thought that the Premarin study turned out so badly is that Premarin, yeah, yeah, that it gave, you know, heart disease and stroke was, was yeah. from the way that it's prepared by torturing by pregnant women. Horses, horses. Yeah. And, and and keeping them, keeping them tortured and in stalls and and, and, and just terrible, 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 terrible conditions to make primarin. Yeah. And that's and gotta do something to the medicine. medicine. Right. It's gotta make, it's make it harmful. Harmful. You know, when mm -hmm. when, it, when that's the energy that's, the energy that's, that's going, going into it. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and, yeah it's and, that, and it's funny that it's funny that there's no money. There's no money really because yeah, I know people who try to get money made mostly nature to study plant based estrogens. You know, for postmenopausal yeah, post conditions. conditions, there's no money, there's in, no money that. in that. Yeah, I guess because, I guess plants, because plants are too cheap. Are too cheap. <laughs> yeah, it must be. I don't yeah, they're too natural. Yeah. Just to trouble the idea. Okay. Okay. So there's plenty of so aspirin. You know, out of a bottle can help as a blood thinner, and there are some medicines that work in predictable ways. Not every single medicine. So are we going to imagine that the factory where it was made is somehow a better, more humorous factory than the factory? That well, that's a good point. And here's, here's what I used to tell my HIV patients, because I saw this uh, early on treating HIV. The patients who believed that the medicine was to make pharmaceutical companies money and was a poison and took it anyway did not do well. But I said to other patients to take this medicine, look at it, thank it for what it can do, and take it in a positive way that this medicine is coming to bless me. And people did much better with the same medicine. So, you know, you're mentioning where it's coming from, from the factory. You can actually negate the vibrations by infusing it with a prayer. And I think you, you then get rid of wherever it came from. Mm -hmm. And by doing it in a proper way with prayer, you increase its potency. I've mm -hmm. seen this, mm -hmm. you know, and people who took the medicine saying, this has had research so that it will help people. And so I'm going to take it because it, it can help me do much better. The attitude, people with a positive attitude and, and looking optimistically do much better than people with a negative attitude. I've had, I'll tell you another story. I had a patient, his name was Dennis. I'll share the first name. He, he had a terrible attitude about HIV. He would come in, this is when I was working in the Erie County Medical Center in Buffalo, and nobody could do anything right for him. He would come in and the 
uh, he had a chip on his shoulder. Uh, HIV was uh, and it was a plot from the government to kill off gay people, and nobody understood him, and uh, nobody could do anything right. And the nurses would take his blood pressure, and they couldn't do it right. And he was just grumpy, you know. And then I would see him, and I'd say, you know, Dennis, your attitude is going to kill you, not the HIV. No, oh, it's not, you know. And um, the nurses, he got so bad, he was so well known, the nurses would say, Dennis is here, you take care of him. The nurses didn't even want to go and do his weight or blood pressure. So I would go and take care of him. And I would always say, you know, Dennis, your attitude is killing me. Well, one day he came in in a wheelchair because he was wasting away and getting worse and worse. So his friend brought him in in a wheelchair and he had what we call the look. I don't know if you've ever heard that, the look. You have the look. Everybody looked at Dennis, sunken eyes, respirations. I said, Dennis, you have the look. And he goes to me, what's the look? I said, I was trying to be nice. I said, well, the look means you're going to die within six weeks. He said, six weeks, huh? He says, can I go on a cruise? <laughs> I said, really, the look means two weeks. So I was trying to be nice and said six weeks. So I said, I'm thinking, I'm sending a dead man on the boat. But I said to him, can you go on the cruise within the next week? He said, yeah. I said, do you have somebody to wheel you on with your oxygen tank and everything? Yeah. I said, okay, go do it within the next week. Because I thought, I'm going to send this man a dead on the boat. So, and I said, and, and after your cruise, come back. So three weeks later, he comes back. <laughs> He's still alive, and he didn't have the look anymore. I said, Dennis, you look better. I said, what happened? He said, he said, I have four. I, he said, I have three weeks left, right? Because I told him six weeks, so he's counting. I said, he says, I have three weeks left. I said, yeah. He said, well, he said on the cruise. He said, you told me I only had six weeks. He said, so I thought, I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm just going to have a good time, <laughs> and and just enjoy life. And he started to enjoy life. And it changed his entire attitude because he thought he only had three more weeks. Well, I saw him after that and he was looking better. I said, Dennis, your, your attitude has changed. You're going to live longer. He says, you're right. He said, I learned my lesson. He said, and from there, he, he, his ad, total attitude toward life changed. He, he started the neighborhood block club in his neighborhood, started inviting people over, was a positive person, lived two and a half more years before he was a, a real heavy smoker and basically got cryptococcal meningitis after two, two and a half more years. But he had a wonderful life for two and a half years after changing his attitude, and he would have been dead. In, and I've seen this. I mean, he was, a, a, you know, an extreme example, but I've seen this with patients. I myself, I have a positive attitude. And here I am, you know, 38 years later, uh, still living. And I, I told my patients, I said, look, I'm an example for you. Look at my attitude. Look at what I'm doing. If I can do this, you can do this. And people who believe me, they're still around. People who are a negative attitude, and it could have been Dennis, would, would be gone by now. Well, and I, I think that's so relevant to coronavirus because, you know, it, 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 it's like the days of AIDS. We're facing uncertainty. We, we don't know if we'll get it. We don't know if we won't. And if we get it, we don't know if we'll even notice it or if we'll end up on a ventilator in the ICU. You know? And so, so we have to look at how do we approach uncertainty, like with a positive attitude, with prayer, with, you know, communicating with the spirits or with pessimism. You know, I, I have a, a patient who is barricaded in her house in, in, on Long Island. And she hasn't and left, she her house hasn't left her house in four months. Four months. And uh, she is the and she, she is the, the most fearful, most fearful frightened, most person. frightened person. And and, and I thought, and well, well, if if anyone could anyone get it could through the mail, it would be her. Be her. <laughs> 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 yes. Because she's yes. so scared. She's scared. Yeah. 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 And we, we know that fear, fear is bad for your immune system. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It creates fear and the unknown. You know, it's really bad. Talking about fear, I, it's a funny story. I had a woman come to me uh, when I was uh, treating people in Boston for HIV and AIDS. And um, I would share with my patients that I'm HIV positive, you know. And this one woman came and she had such a fear of HIV and AIDS. I don't want to be near anybody. But I developed a good patient 
patient doctor relationship with her, you know. And finally, I had to tell her, I said, look, you know, you're, you're, you're killing yourself. I, I said, I have something, something you may not want to have me as my, your, your doctor anymore. Why is that? I said, because I'm HIV positive. You are? And it's like, but she knew me by then. So it was okay. And then she was okay with HIV after that. <laughs> so it's interesting how relationships can help heal. Just relationships. Yeah. Just yeah. yeah. And you know, the... And, you know, the, the this is something that I think indigenous healers have known for thousands of years. And yet, you know, we've forgotten it in modern medicine. We don't appreciate the importance of attitude and relationship and, and um, being positive in the energy of the situation. One thing I was taught in medical school by the old family doctors, they said, you know, with women, you know, he said, they can be sick and you know they're ready for discharge within the first, within the next couple of days when they start putting their makeup back on it's so true <laughs> yeah it's a good sign a little thing a little sometimes positive. tell us yeah. so much yeah. Yeah. yeah but collectively i was thinking about uh, the stages of grieving the elizabeth Kubler-Ross naming some stages of grieving and how it's never like a straight line from right. you know blaming mm -hmm. and anger and it's these little cycles that we go through. And um, I think with social media too, it's really fear based. Um, you can kind of oh, amplify yeah. that or you can plug into a different kind of collective and, um, and, and grasp hope. But as a, as a, as a nation, we're so, um, we're in these, uh, still in a little bit of disbelief, right? Some people, the people who are saying this is a hoax and other people are saying, well, no, with just basic hygiene, masking, hand washing, you can really, um, you know, continue to live a uh, distance and, and, you know, carry on with some life, being, being safe. But I think as a collective, we are um, cycling through these phases of, of, um, of grieving. And um, hopefully, I don't know, with the use of plugging into the right people and spirit, or maybe unplugging, from social media and uh, being a little more connected with those who are directly around you, find a little more hope. There. Yeah. Yeah. Social media, I'm telling you, the stuff I get there, the propaganda, I call it propaganda, which has a negative connotation. Propaganda simply means you're, you're, you're biased and you're trying to have other people pick up your bias and share it and spread mm -hmm. it. Um, but some of that says, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a plot or it's a hoax, you know, it's a hoax and, and masks don't do anything. There's a lot of confusion around a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of these, I mean, I've listened to an hour of propaganda. People, people keep sending me this stuff and then I, 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 I take notes and I say, well, this fact is distorted. This is lifted from the truth. This is out of context, you know, and, and, uh, and they say, some of these doctors are saying, you know, masks are no good. Studies show masks can kill you. Well, I went to look on the study. There's no study that shows masks can kill you, but because a recognized doctor says it on a film, studies show that, you know, who's, what studies? There's none that show that, but, you know, there, and of course, if you think about it, there, there's, people don't die by wearing masks. Theoretically, you can get hypercapnia a little bit, which is increased CO2. Breathing in a paper bag works better than breathing in a mask. Theoretically, you don't release as much heat, so you could maybe overheat a little bit easier, but really you don't die from using a mask. And then there's another statement by a doctor, you're breathing in your own germs, so you can get sick. Well, if there are your own germs, you have antibodies against them anyway. So it doesn't make logical sense. But when you're a lay person listening to this doctor tell you this, you become automatically paranoid. I have one a woman who comes to Sundance actually, and she doesn't want to wear a mask. So she listens to all this stuff and makes it her truth that this is why you don't want to wear a mask. And I'm thinking, you know, you're going on false statements here. And I, I wrote very detailed why that was, so she won't believe me. You know, I, there's no studies. You know, first impressions, you can't tell me differently. This is what they said, this is what I believe. It supports my not wanting to wear a mask. So I'm not gonna take the truth or the, you know, I'm gonna believe that there are studies when there aren't. It's interesting how people react. Yeah. I've done the same thing. I've looked, at, I've looked for studies. Who's saying this and where did they publish it? Yeah, and, they say. Who's they? And they have links. But yeah. The link will be to like 
a, an advertisement or something, I mean, the link won't go anywhere. It looks very professional. And also, I like to remind people that a doctor doing an operation might wear a mask for eight hours. So if you really think that after hour six, your doctor is losing it because of ingesting carbon dioxide, then you're going to rethink that operation. There's a, you know, yeah. if you have something really wrong with you, then what are you going to do? Because do you want him breathing on you or would you rather he had the mask on? Yeah. So. It's crazy. Some of the, some of the stuff circulating on the internet and people believe this stuff. Incredible. Well, you know, a big, you know, a big, um, um, well, a well, common, common hypnotic, hypnotic technique is to say research, research has shown that. Oh, perfect! And Absolutely, and what we want. Exactly. Oh, and that's what there was a. This was a surgeon talking about masks, and he said, "Studies show it's it's uh, you know people die from wearing masks. It's, it's got more uh, drawbacks than benefits, which is totally not true, but it's a surgeon saying it. So you know." Yeah, too bad. Incredible. No one asked him, no one asked him how long he wore, wore a mask yeah. for surgery. Wore a mask for his own surgery. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but he was like, and he was all fired up about it. So, of course, that'll get you all fired up about, well, we must be, that's right, you know. Mm -hmm. it's incredible. And you're right. It's like a mass hypnosis, really. Uh, and social media is a wonderful way to hypnotize a lot of people into believing wrong things. So... You know, in the old days, just because it's written doesn't make it true. Just because it's on social media, probably it's not true. Mm -hmm. So you want to really... Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, it's so true. And, you know, I, I, have, no, I, I have, use Facebook I mostly, to mostly to send out information, send out information about information things that I'm doing. That I'm doing. And, and so I have, so I have um, um, friends, friends that would never be my friends if they yeah. knew me. <laughs> And it's, and it's, and it's and shocking, shocking some of the so things that they post, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm telling you. And, and what I've learned is, you know, you try to counter counteract some of these propaganda posts, you know, and I send the facts to the people and they keep the next propaganda post. I keep getting shared. What do you think of this? <laughs> no, <laughs> they just don't get it. It's, it's uh, threatening, actually, in a way. We have to be... Uh, we have to be, you know, objective more. So, so one of the interesting things that maybe we could speak to is, is that, you know, those of the four of us sitting here are, we believe in hardcore science, but we also believe in spirits, you know, and um, maybe you could speak a little bit, it's too wide seeing at its best, I think. You know, yeah. you know that that we want, that we want you know, you know we, we i mean i do I believe do that believe medicine eventually, eventually gets, it right. gets it right slowly, slowly but, but surely. surely sometimes, sometimes a lot slower, slower than, than, I than i want yeah but but, but, but uh, uh it's trial and error, trial and error you, know? you know sure and and, and um, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm critical i'm critical of medicine frequently medicine because i think because i think you know it's not our own evidence you know some of my pet criticisms are statins you know, you not, know everyone not everyone should be on a statin. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, I have others. others. But not every Maybe labor, labor should, be should be induced. You know. Oh, yeah. uh, so yeah. I've got so some, I've got criticisms, some criticisms, criticisms, but I think, but I think there's, there's data, data, to support data to support those, those criticisms. criticisms. You know, it's you know, data, data that people, that people are, ignoring are ignoring for political, political and, and potentially economic, economic reasons. reasons. Yeah. And medicine has their own myths. I mean, when I was in medical school, School back in the 70s, uh, stress that caused all things. And if I would have said to my teachers, and you know, they story is, is uh, definitely involved in ulcers. That being said, reminds me of the argument, I can't remember his name, but he and Pasteur had a big argument about germs causing disease. And I can't remember his name again with a B. Anyway, so Peter was right that germs cause some illnesses. But other people can have the same germs and not get ill. For instance, a lot of people carry in their nasal passages uh, meningococcal uh, disease, which can cause meningitis. But yet they carry it without meningitis and without symptoms. So it's the parable of the 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 store with the seed, it's the, which would be the germs falling on fertile ground, which is the conditions to have the, the disease manifest versus seeds falling on rocks or whatever. So is 
germs that might cause disease or, or certain sicknesses, but it's the lay of the land or, or the fertility, the, the invitation, as people can carry those germs around and not get sick. Or it's the same with COVID, actually. You get the, the virus, people carry around that. Some people get sick, other people don't. What is the underlying predisposition to it? Uh, or miasma, I guess you call it homeopathy. What's the underlying predisposition? Well, age, immunocompromised to begin with. You have a position, and there's genetics involved in some of this as well, which reminds me of another thing. The Navajos really got it, uh, affected with uh, COVID versus their un their outlying communities of white people. Same thing with uh, back in the day, smallpox. Smallpox would hit white people and we'd get over it more often than the natives who got hit with the same thing. So there's got to be a genetic predisposition to certain groups genetically, as well as, of course, clinically. I mean, whether they have the under age or, or underlying immune uh, problems. So I think the lay of the land is important for COVID-19 uh, to manifest or not. Um, so we have all of this individualization in a way because of various conditions. So good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're getting probably close to the end because you need to work on your house. I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, does anyone have any thoughts before, we're, before we call it a day? Yeah. To be continued. Before we stop, uh, yeah. have you heard anything from any of our Lakota friends about this whole COVID? Their response to this whole COVID nineteen. Well, the Pine Ridge is on lockdown, and first of all, the the. the Cheyenne River, Standing Rock, Pine Ridge, a lot of these wanted to be on lockdown early and the governor said no. Mm -hmm. Well, Indians are a sovereign people and they have every right to, to their, as we talking about their negative experience with, with smallpox back in the day, and it could uh, affect them worse than the population they have ever to, to lock down their reservations. And in fact, they have. Um, Pine Ridge now has 115 cases, uh, and so they've been off and on on lockdown. Um, so it, it's a problem, and they have every right to to sell. All right. Well, well I want to thank well, you, Neil, for thank you Neil, for taking time away from time repairing away from your house, house to <laughs> talk with us. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to leave.